Hello and welcome to Our Experts Podcast. I am Carol Matichka, your host, bringing you fascinating perspectives from the world and realm of pharmacy. Well, hello, and today we have with us the director of the pharmacy at the Cleveland Clinic in Port St. Lucie, as well as the FSHP past president. We're so happy to have with us today, uh, Dr. Bill Turnius. So welcome, Bill. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor. Oh, absolutely. Uh, to be able to give back and whatnot. Oh, yeah. It, we just appreciate you so much. You've provided so much of your own precious time to um, one of our fine state organizations. So we really appreciate you doing that. And I know on this show, we talk a lot about the FPA, um, but I really want our listeners to know more about the FSH or FSHP as well. So can you talk to our audience a little bit about FSHP and maybe some of the big changes that have gone on in the organization in the last few years? Sure, absolutely. You know, going back as a, uh, I remember my first day at pharmacy school at UF and then asking to get involved and I hear these different organizations that are out there and the importance of joining it. It wasn't really until I got out of school my residency, and I had a mentor that basically said, Bill, you're going to be the president of the Treasure Coast chapter of health system pharmacists. Bill, I want you on the educational council for FSHP. And he really nudged me into getting involved. And it's been one of my best uh, career moves and for myself, but also for our profession. And so I encourage all the listeners to be actively involved in, in either FPA, FSHP, and reality is for both. You know, FSHP, for those who don't know, FSHP is a broad term of the Florida Society of Health System Pharmacists. And a lot of times people just correlate that to just hospital pharmacists. And true, that is the case, but we also envelop have, we have uh, ambulatory care pharmacists, industry uh, related pharmacists, uh, a lot of specialty other pharmacies within our, and pharmacists within our organization. And that's what really makes uh makes FSHP so special and so unique is the, the diversity of all the unique professions that exist out there for, for pharmacy. And we really try to embrace all of them into the organization. So a lot of effort has been involved with over the past several years to really reach out to a lot of different uh, modalities of pharmacy and professions within our own profession to, to join and be actively involved with FSHP. That's great. And so you talked a little bit about being in pharmacy school. So let's go back a little bit. Why did you look at pharmacy as a career? What, what was the inspiration behind that? Uh, all right. So uh, oh, we're very going fun. way back, well, right? <laughs> I, no, I mean, I've been in pharmacy since I was 16 years old. Oh, wow. And um, I was a junior in high school. And I told myself that I wasn't going to work here. I wasn't going to work here. And I was giving myself standards like I wasn't going to work fast food and all these different other places. And I was 16. But at the time, all I really cared about was I needed a job to pay for my car insurance and the gas for my truck. And I played baseball. I played a lot of competitive baseball. A Walgreens was opening up down the street. And I decided, know what? I'll go back, go there. And uh, I applied and I, I hounded them and they hired me to stock the shelves. So I was stocking milk and toilet paper and everything else. And then one day uh, they needed me to go back to the pharmacy. And I went back there and said, OK, Bill, this is what you do. And they showed me and I, I'm like, man, this is great. For a six, 17 year old, this is fantastic. Well, as the time went on, long story short, I really started enjoying it. I have had other great mentors like Norman Tamak and others to really kind of nudge me, hey, you should really think about going to pharmacy. And as I know, I really like math, sciences, and helping. And, and so that was the path that got me started going to pharmacy school. And that's what kind of kicked it off for me, all just because I needed a job. Oh, but I really enjoy great. everything about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think your story holds true for a lot of people. Some, you know, some have pharmacists in their family, but a lot kind of fall into it, fall in love with it. I love that. Um, so let's go back to FSHP a little bit. Um, what are some big sure. events that you maybe want to share with our audience that might be coming up for FSHP that they might be interested in? So one of the things that I, I like to promote, I mean, FSHP, you know, similar to a lot of other structures, you know, ASHP, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, is the overarching 
society at a national level. FSHP is at our state level. And then we have our regional chapters. At the state chapter, we have each year our annual meeting, which is held the first week in August. I feel of being as serving as the past now current, I mean, as the past president, as a state run pharmacy organization, we have one of the biggest, best professional state pharmacy organization meetings throughout the country. And I, I'm, we're very proud of that. It's an excellent venue for students, excellent venue for pharmacists of networking, career building, vendors and meeting new ideas and see and, and the educational content's fantastic. And that happens once a year at our annual, like I said, our annual meeting. However, one of the things to take away too that of, of our structure within FSHP, we have our regional chapters. So for example, in my, where I live in Port, uh, Sebastian's and where I work in Port St. Lucie, we're part of the Treasure Coast chapter of Health System Pharmacists. I think you, Carol, are in the Northeast chapter of Health System Pharmacists. And so throughout the state, there are these regional chapters. And some of these regional chapters are very active of giving CEs and also networking opportunities. And so being a member of FSHP, become a member of one of these regional societies, and it gives you the opportunity to really network locally, but also throughout the state. Oh, so I would great. catch up on the state meeting, but also get involved with your local society because they are having meetings as well, either virtual or in person. Yeah, absolutely. All right, great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so you're an extremely strong advocate, obviously, for pharmacists and pharmacy and have been extensively involved in the legislative process, and probably more so, and you probably learned a lot in your presidency. I know I did with um, FPA. Um, so what are some of the priorities that you're aware of? Let's, let's start nationally. What are some of the priorities maybe that ASHP is looking at um, this year? You'll see that a lot of our similarities line up uh, between our state and national. But at the national level, the priority number one is, is focus is the con the 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 ability to, for us to be able to bill and provider status. Um, and here, talk the buzz uh, around that and surrounding the features of that. I think is really a necessary feature or a plug for our profession is to, to advocate for that at a national federal level. And when we're talking about that, is really talking about Medicare, Medicaid, and things like that. Other things that ASHP is really pushing is protection on certain other things such as 340B um, reimburse, uh, 340B, as well as PBM uh, reform. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the big hitters that we're really focusing and targeting on. I know there's a lot of other ones, but the provider status is one that hopefully won't I mean will keep gaining momentum because I think that's what we have is that momentum. I agree. And so we've talked on this show quite a bit about provider status and how um, we see the importance of it for sure in community pharmacy. Um, can you give a little bit of in ambulatory care, et cetera, can you give some perspective, I guess, from the hospital side, um, being a director of pharmacy and how that might have an implications for you all? You know, on the inpatient side, you know, pure inpatient on the hospital side, the provider status is not really so much of a of a of an impact or a need because we have a lot of protocols and PT protocols that allow us to do uh, a function within a certain scope or within the scope of that protocol that we have. Um, kind of like a collaborative practice agreement, I guess, but um, it allows us to do a lot of that kind of stuff already. So the provider status, not so much, and then hospital-based billing, you know, how a lot of our billing within hospitals are based off of what's called a DRG and to reimburse us specifically, everything falls into that DRG bucket. But where we see the most impact for that will be in our ambulatory care clinics and our health system clinics that we have, sure. where we're truly trying to target the idea of preventing re-emissions, for example, uh, CHF re-emissions and patient gets discharged with uh, CHF and they need to get follow-up. Can we provide a venue as an outpatient to provide some comprehensive medication management that um, we'll be able to do as an outpatient and goals and hopes to help prevent them from being readmitted. And now the struggle we've always had as a profession is, well, it's great. We have evidence shown, demonstrating that we can do this and help prevent readmissions. A lot of times it boils down to that, 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 that the financial impact of having a pharmacist in the ambulatory care setting or in that, that clinic. Right, I, I agree. 
but and it blows my mind that we are able to save so much money in the healthcare system and help patients tremendously, but we're still at this point where we're not considered providers. And um, so I, I really hope that we can see that push this year and, and really get that passed. Um, so in regards and I'm to- I'm sorry, can I go back? One thing about what ASHV is really pushing, and I'll, I'll send you the link too, because I would like to get it posted out there. You know, one of the things that, we ASHP really felt, and I think it's in general as a profession, is to really get our name out there as what we do. You know, um, and ASHP put this t- together a multi-million dollar uh, advertising campaign about we are your pharmacist and what we do. And I think a lot of people have and nothing have this stereotypical stereotypical picture of what a pharmacist is. And that's great. We do have those, and we obviously it's very neat and very important. But there's so much about and what makes our profession so unique is there's so many different things that we we do and contribute to healthcare, and that so many people don't know that. All they think about is this person you see at the corner versus all the other things that are happening. And there's this great video that I'll I'll share with you. Hopefully we can put out there to get get more people to see it because this makes me very proud to see, hey, I'm a pharmacist. Yes, I help with your diabetes medications or your oncology medications, your heart failure, seizure, and all those other different things. But we really need to get that word out to not just our own profession, but to our communities of what we do and the value that we bring. I think that's great. I'll put that in the show notes and hopefully everybody can share that because um, I think that's fantastic. Throw it out there on social media, et cetera. Um, Absolutely. So where do we stand um, in Florida in regards to our legislative um process or, Efforts. or yeah our priorities there so align it again and we really think that our priorities <clears throat> we hit for several years but i think we're getting more and more momentum and i really encourage pharmacists students watching this is to get involved and I, it, to get involved legislatively and and you can do that through fpa and fshp be part of that year and vocalize this because this is the year that we really need to advocate for our profession. And the one specific thing that we're really focusing on our top priority is gonna be focusing around reimbursement for pharmacists for cognitive services, all right? And recognizing that through our systems that we need as pharmacists be recognized as those providers and, and the services that we offer and get reimbursed for adequately you know that we have current pro- we have methods now to get reimbursement through MTM codes, and there are current billing codes that only allow us to bill at a certain level. But to get fifteen dollars back for a forty-five minute to an hour visit with a, pa- a patient is unsustainable. Yeah. And I think that we really need to get that expectation to put us out there and we the, and, the, and demonstrate that value for us. And so that is going to be a big push for us this year for FSHB. We're very fortunate legislatively here in the state of Florida that. We have two pharmacists that are in the House of Representatives in this for our state. And having them as our advocates has been tremendous for us and as a profession. And if everybody has the opportunity to thank them, because it is a unrelenting, sacrificial job that they're going through that uh, for our profession and against their and for their families. But our, our goal this year for our priorities is to focus on our prior provider status. And as anybody watching this, if you want to see the profession change and that it's needed to do, they need to invest in this piece right now and, be, and, and vocalize. Agree. And, you know, FSHP and FPA have worked really well together, I think, to, to deliver this message. And that'll continue on. And I tell people join one, join both. There's nothing wrong with joining both either. Um, They're really pushing for our profession to move forward. So this is, this is really the year I feel like we can make a huge, huge impact. Um, Let me ask you a little bit. Am I? Sure. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you, you wanted to say something, feel free. Um, No, because all I was going to say is my, my, my overall being in this for, I mean, I graduated from UF in 05 and seen at a time where there's so many, at a time there's a huge demand for pharmacists, huge demand. And you see schools pop up and a lot of enrollment happening. And there's a shift or a mindset that's, I mean, people will have this fear of we're saturating the market of, of, of pharmacists. And enrollment increased and a lot of things increased, but one could argue that 
during that time of all these new students, we also had an expansion of residency programs and expansion of unique pharmacy services. We were putting pharmacists in the ERs and ICUs and different unique settings because we had to. We were growing our profession. And so, however, that message of fear of we have too many students in too many schools, a lot of people stopped going, stopped enrolling. So I know my, I have a suspicion that uh, the enrollment for schools have started decreasing quite significantly. And my fear as a profession is, for lack of a better word, going backwards, all right? Because all that great things that we did with all this expansion, we're, we're pulling back, we, we may have to pull back because we have to do the basic functions of, of, our, of our profession. I see where in the future, what, what's going to change is there's going to be a gap, potentially a shortage. And that's kind of a, this is my opinion, by the way, as a shortage of pharmacists in the near future because of this. And if we have a shortage, what's going to happen? We're going to have this gap. And how do we fill this gap? And this gap, I think, is going to be filled either by increasing scope of pharmacy technicians and what they're allowed to do. Uh, you may see... I, I will see think the role of AI is going to come up and fill some of the stuff up. And third, and what I don't want to happen is this backtracking of pharmacy services of, hey, well, can't do ER anymore, up, oh, can't do ICU anymore, up, oh, can't do PEDS anymore, and bring it back into doing basic functions. So I think as a profession of where the future is heading is getting involved, especially help crafting some of these messages and filling these gaps is incredibly important. And again, going back to be involved with your state pharmacy organizations. Sorry, that was my little soapbox. No, I, I love that. And that is a fantastic point. So I will tell you, being in academia, we have seen a decrease in the number of applicants who are coming through. And part of that, I think, is us. Like, we have to have the voice to let future students know this is a great profession. There's a lot we are doing. There's a lot we will continue to do. And, and the sky's the limit. Um, because there was that pullback. And I'm seeing, I'm hearing the same thing in, in community uh, pharmacy is this difficulty in finding pharmacists already. So um, I agree with you. But that's something that we as pharmacists, pharmacy students, residents, whoever's out there is really to promote our profession. And of course, the organizations do right. that, but we can do that ourselves as well. Um, so you, you mentioned AI. And from your perspective, how do you see AI changing hospital practice? Oh, it already has. Okay. So, uh, I, I'll be honest. I'm a tech geek. Uh, I, I'm a gadget geek, and I like seeing things come up front. But I think AI is coming in fast and strong in our society and healthcare as well. We're seeing it being used to help with scheduling of surgical procedures from even order of verification, potentially. I mean, it's not quite at my facility yet, but you're going to start seeing AI in the role of order verification, potentially, or uh, recommendations of therapies and, and whatnot. Um, I, I think AI is going to fill a void, especially on a, it's not just pharmacists, this, this idea of healthcare. And not many people going into come nurses, physicians, pharmacists, and or in the healthcare setting that AI is going to try to fill out fill that void and fill some of that gap. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I think there is a lot of value into helping improve healthcare with AI. I mean, we've heard the t the the the, the uh, articles being published about how AI is assisting with uh, radiologists and identifying certain types of tumors or lesions quicker and faster and it's it's common and, and also help assisting physicians in diagnosing um i think for pharmacists it is a, again another fear of ai is going to come in and replace your job uh, and i think we had that fear of technology uh, years ago of technology is going to come in and replace pharmacists and pharmacy techs and ai is going to replace pharmacists and i heard this at a summit this past this summer that you know, the saying is AI is not going to replace the pharmacist, but the pharmacist that uses AI will replace those who do not. 
That's exactly right. It's the same with computers, right? Correct. I think there was a huge fear with computers in the beginning. And um, I think that's where our soft skills and it are going to be absolutely huge and necessary when we're talking with patients, talking with other healthcare professionals, because we can use AI as a tool, um, but it's us, the pharmacists, I think, who have yes. to have all of the, those skills and be able to utilize them appropriately. But I agree. I think everybody has to know how to utilize it appropriately. You have to start learning it. You may not be an expert right away, but start learning that as part of someone's professional development. As part of mine is, how do I learn more about how to utilize AI and the functionality? What does it mean? Because so much of the AI revolves around what questions you ask and asking the right question into that that model of chat GPT or Copilot or uh, the others. But uh, I encourage everybody to start tinkering with it. And of course, yeah, absolutely. And interpreting what is the output, making sure that that looks appropriate, knowing where the sources absolutely. are coming from. I've had some interesting sources where they pull from and you're like, that's not quite right. So so we are still yep. at that point where we need yep. to make sure that, that we're a big part of that. So um, let's change gears a little bit. PBMs we know have just wreaked havoc on community pharmacy, independent pharmacy, um, how has that impacted the hospital world, if you will? So on the inpatient, inpatient side, not so much. Um, however, a lot of hospitals have outpatient infusions, mm -hmm. all right, where we administer medications. Um, and so where PBMs have an impact on us is there are PBMs out there that have not given us contracts to, to dispense their medication. So what that means is they would have to kind of white bag it. Now, some some hospitals say no white bagging is allowed. Uh, some hospitals uh, allow it, but with certain criteria. It all depends. And I'm sure a lot of your audience knows what white bagging is, but that's just to recap. It's just when a a a a patient. PBM says you have to get this medicate, this specialty drug filled at our specialty pharmacy. That specialty pharmacy will then mail it to me at the hospital and then I will administer it. So the challenge I have as a director and, and oversees an outpatient infusion is I have a patient who has a medication, very expensive medication has to get filled at the specialty pharmacy, but it also has to be administered by a healthcare professional. The specialty pharmacy fills it and mails it to me or where they think is me. Now let's just say this is a $20,000 drug, but I don't get it. Mm. Where did it go? It ended up over here. It ended up over there. Where did it go? Is it now, is it properly temperatured? Is it uh, appropriately stored? I have to now go hunting, finding for it. This is not even my drug. But I'm trying to do this. I mean, we do this for our patients, but we don't get any reimbursement or financial because it's already been paid for by the PBM to the employee. And then we all charge as a, a small nominal fee for administration. But the specialty pharmacy mail it to us and now it's lost. Wow. And so it 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 creates that challenge for that patient and for us because. I, I don't know where it's at or don't I can't find it or it's expired or and it's missing. And it's all because of that communication into the chain versus just allowing me to acquire my drug through my my channels and being able to have it here and ready to supply to the patient. Right. That's the biggest challenge we have with PBMs because these PBMs are not given our hospitals and our health systems these specialty contracts. Uh, for our, our 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 patients in Florida. Now there are there is a PBM reform that we had a year and a half or so ago here in Florida, and it has helped out in a little bit, very minor, helped out a little bit. And there's still a lot of opportunities, and that is a thing that both FSHP, FPA, FHA, and others are really looking at. Hey, we really need to put more broadness into this, allow health systems to have these contracts with these PBMs. Mm. That was going to be my next question is how the bill helped, but it sounds like you're still having some difficulty in that regard. So it is the, the bill it throughout the state has been very challenging, uh, both hospital and for our community pharmacies, because getting a contract, the, the law says basically you have to meet certain criteria for a hospital in order to be 
in order for the PBM to be required to give you a contract. Now they may give you a contract, but they may say, okay, we're only give you a fraction of what the drug actually costs. So let's say a drug cost me $20,000 and the contract says, okay, we're only gonna give you uh, AWP minus 10% and you're actually losing I minus mean, and they only give you $5,000 for that drug. Well, that's not a viable, sustainable contract. Yeah, you gave me a contract, but it's not a, a practical one. Um, but that's another reason why we need to be involved and need to Absolutely. work with our state organizations to really um, put the PBM's feet to the fire, if you will, and make sure that that they're, you know, things are being done correctly. So, um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, I know that we hear a lot about shortages that are going on and, and how are those impacting you in, in your practice setting? And are we seeing any improvements? Where, where, where are we going with all of those? You know, the really concept of the shortages I've been battling with over the past like 10, 15 years, you get to a point of being able to adjust, live and accept a lot of these shortages, depending on what they are. You know, over the past several years, it's gotten better of, of certain products will have on shortages. And a lot of it boils down to the market and the manufacturing. Uh, the whole concept of the economics, again, going through school, I really wasn't paying attention a lot about the economics of supply and demand and financial outcomes of, of drugs. But it's something very pivotal for us to know is great that a drug costs five cents, but if there's only one company that makes it and they stop making it, well, then what happens? Well, another company, well, if there's 10 different manufacturers, let me back it up, if there's 10 different manufacturers who are making, let's say, a Torvastatin, yeah, drugs go down to five cents per tablet. Well, then if somebody says, hey, I'm not winning the market or if I'm not making any money off this, I went back off. It's a business for them. And so they're going to stop making it. Well, as players start exiting the field, now there's only one manufacturer making a Torvastatin. Again, I don't know that's the case. I'm just using this as a hypothetical. There's only one manufacturer making this drug, then guess what's gonna to happen to the price? The price is just gonna skyrocket and shoot. And if that manufacturer has an issue and their manufacturing capabilities, it creates a huge shortage and it, it shifts from one manufacturer to another. One manufacturer may have, um, let's say if there's two manufacturers out in the market for a particular drug, one has 60%, uh, let's say 80% of the market, and 20, the other one has 20% of the market. And the one that has 80% of the market goes down for some reason, leaving this company that only had was scaled up for 20%. Well, now they're expected to make the whole 80, 100%. Well, then everybody starts buying from that one company, and then that creates another shortage. Mm -hmm. So, it's gotten better over the years. There are still those hiccups, but honestly, the, the big shortage that you probably hear more of, and it's it's funny to watch some of the, the TikToks, I guess, is our IV shortage, our IV fluid shortage going on right now. And that is a very pivotal one for us because getting IV fluids such as normal saline and dextrose and, and uh, lactated ringers. And that's a great example of what I was just mentioning is that you have a manufacturer who dominated them well, had a bigger chunk of the market. You're in, uh, unfortunately, that plant in North Carolina got uh, uh, hit severely through Hurricane Helene, and that whole plant went down, leaving only a couple manufacturers out there who had only a, a small piece of the pie expecting to take care of the rest of the country. It really highlighted some of our deficiencies are an opportunities for improvement throughout the nation of uh, how do we handle these things. Yeah. The IV shortage one is very kind of a, a tough one going on right now. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's what I've been hearing quite a bit about as well. But I think you helped explain it, I think, really nicely to people who don't necessarily have an understanding. So thank you for that. Um, so I have alumni who contact me from time to time saying, hey, I'd like to make the switch from community pharmacy to hospital pharmacy. Um, what would you say to an individual like that? Maybe they've been in community pharmacy for years, but they'd like to, to make a switch. What would you recommend to them? I think the opportunities are going to increase, ex will exist in the future and increase more. I think past several years, I, I think it was a little harder just because, yeah, we had a lot of residents coming out. And there's still a lot, but, um, and the hospital jobs are harder to find. And this P 
people have this mindset that in order for me to get into the hospital, I have to do a residency. And that held true for a long time. And it still, it depends on the hospital and, and the director of who would they recruit for. Uh, however, I would be uh, encourage people to be optimistic in, in their searches. And one of the things how I would answer this person is how I would answer a student and any other pharmacist in any other profession is, I'm a firm believer of continuous lifelong professional development. And no matter what area of pharmacy you're going into, you have to continue to learn. And I give this, I, I've given a presentation regarding this. I, I correlate your career as an investment. People say, yeah, it's an investment. And it is an investment, right? It's probably one of the single largest investments you have made on your life. And I kind of connect it to, for me to correlate this is I have a 401k, 403b, whatever you want to call it for retirement. It's an investment. How do I nurture that investment? Well, I nurture that investment by every two weeks, I put a little bit of money into that investment. And every two weeks, as it continues to grow, what is that providing me? That 401k is providing me as it continues to grow. It grows and grows. It's providing me security, stability, flexibility. It's creating me opp future opportunities, future opportunities. And that is an investment. Well, do I invest in only my 401k for four years? Of course not. I invest in that over the course of my life of 20, 30 plus years. So how come we as a profession have this tendency of this huge investment of our profession, of pharmacy, of you, that only goes to school for four years and then stops nurturing that investment? You need to continue to nurture this investment. And how do you nurture that investment? And you don't have to go and, I mean, go to school and can keep doing these different things, but there are different ways of doing it. One way is crit other credentials. I, I mean, went back and got a, a master's degree in uh, business analytics and healthcare analytics. Uh, I got board certified. Uh, other things of being involved in your state pharmacy chapters and your regional chapters, being the president and, and board directors and, and secretary, treasurers, uh, getting out there and networking. And so if you want to move into the hospital setting, one of the best things I would tell you is continue to continue the professional development. What that means for you is that first, I think the first step is getting involved with your local and state pharmacy organization and start networking and meeting those people. That's excellent advice. Thank you so much. And um, I will say that you know, there's a shortage of hospital administration as well, pharmacy administration. And sounds like with you, you got your um, your master's degree, which is certainly an option. Um, is that required in a position for a directorship? Uh, depends on who your employer is. Right. But no, I'm just, I'm just using, you know, I don't think so. Like I say, the, the value that it brought to me, it, it has provided me a lot of value. I think in my current position and not just in my current position, my professional in my personal life as well. But, you know, the point I think you had, you, you kind of touched upon, which is very interesting is a lot of people think, well, I have to stay within my pharmacy windows, my pharmacy, when my pharmacy world. And there are many farm, there are many, there are many directors that are out there that, um, not even directors, but, pharmacists that hold COO positions or mm -hmm. CEO type positions in a organization, either a hospital or health system or a pharmacy or of some sort, that it provides those windows, those opportunities that enable to, 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 to branch out, to create those opportunities for the future. You know, talking to my wife, uh, which I'm very fortunate for my wife and my family and everything that they help with support, me through a lot of this stuff is, you know, why go back to school? Why go back and get this degree? Is it providing me any value right now? And the answer is, well, it's providing me a little value, but some of the things of when you develop yourself and add these things to, to help build your, your own professional development, it may come in handy right then, but it also may create you that opportunity in the future. Again, it's like almost like a future investment of, hey, Bill has this criteria, has this, this experiences, and then those opportunities may come to you you may not realize it because you've done this professional development. And the sky really is the limit with pharmacists. I think that there are so many things, like you said, we can do. Absolutely. And we don't always think about them at the time. I always tell people, don't 
don't close doors. You never know where that's going to lead. So um, couldn't agree with you more there. All right. Well, is there anything else? We talked a lot about uh, several different topics, but anything else you want to share with us, Bill, before we end? No, I mean, I, to your audience, to everybody here, I mean, I, I agree this, you know, one of the things that when I first got into pharmacy, I was very, both, I had one idea of what pharmacy was. And then through school, I was very focused on grades and activity, this and that, so forth. I really didn't really see the breadth of what we as a profession can do and contribute to. I had some great mentors, actually some up there in UF, Jackson, that said, hey, Bill, you should think about doing a residency. And I was, I'm like, I don't know. And they really kind of nudged me and uh, to do that. And, and I did. And I got a, I got a residency. I did my residency over at Moffitt Cancer Center over in Tampa. And I had a great residency director. And he goes, Bill, take a look at this opera, look at the, as a profession. He, and he showed me one of the things that I had as a, as a resident. And I'll tell you, I show this to my students is go to the ACCP.com and look at the jobs that are there. And if you look at the jobs that are on ACCP, the uniqueness of it. Oh, there's pharmacists and cardiovascular medicine and neuromedicine and research and uh, pediatrics and academia. And you, you can name all these different unique things that are out there. And it really blew my mind that, that, that it, those things exist. Uh, but the other piece that people forget about is those things exist. But what path, and if that's going to be a goal for you, make sure you do the steps in front of it to set you up onto that path. I had, I remember a long time ago, I had, I, I was trying to encourage somebody to do a residency and the person decided to, to back out. And uh, this person wanted to be a transplant pharmacist. And I'm like, well, why'd you back out? And the individual says, well, I was told I can get to where I want to go without doing a residency. And I'm like, I, I believe that too. I mean, he had encouraged more luck and dedication and, and whatnot. But I'm like, in order, if you wanted to get, become a transplant pharmacist, that's a difficult road to do. You have to make sure you put the steps that you need to do in order to put you onto that path if that's your goal you want to become on. A lot of things don't happen based off luck. But anyways, no, uniqueness of our profession. And I think the last thing I want to wrap up with I mean, for me is part of that professional development for me was that investment. A lot of decisions are being made for us in our profession up in Tallahassee and these groups. And if you as a as a pharmacist technician want to continue to contribute to your investment and profession, you have to get involved and you have to be, be a voice and you have to be that supportive in order to do that. Otherwise, you're just sitting there and letting somebody else make these decisions for you. Couldn't agree with you more. And we talk a lot about the national stage. But really at the state level is where we see so much of an impact on our profession and where we can make a huge difference. Right. So a lot of people don't have that reckon that, that difference of your national level and your state level. Because national level, they may say, Yeah, you can go do this. But then at the state level it says, Nope, you can't. And so um, um it really does start a lot of time with your state stuff. Couldn't agree with you more. Well, thank you so much, Bill. We really want to thank Dr. Turnies for joining us today on the podcast. It's been an excellent conversation. Um, thank you. And to those of you who are listening, you can support the show by, you know, being a part or subscribing to our YouTube channel as well as the podcast. So thank you to our listeners for being here as well. Take care, everyone.